This is the DePod of DePaul Hoops podcast brought to you by 199.com. Basketball historians bringing history to life with retro DePaul basketball gear to make you feel like a Guire in 1979. Go check them out today at 199.com and pick up some of that retro DePaul basketball gear featuring Billy Blue Demon on it at 199.com. Have a great show for you today. We have Marty Embry from the 1980 or the mid 1980s DePaul teams and Ray Myers last team. We also have our good friend Dalton from the Blue Demon Report for some roster talk. All right, Blue Demon Nation, let's jump on in. Welcome into the DePod, a DePaul Hoops podcast. I'm your host, John Maniatis, and thank you for joining me for the second episode of the DePod. Thank you for all who joined me last episode with our interview with Dwayne Peavy, and thank you for any newcomers who have uh, joined us for the first time today. As I said before, we've got a great show for you all. We've got Marty Embry from the 80s, mid-80s uh, DePaul basketball teams, uh, coached by Ray Meyer and Joey Meyer. Uh, we talk a little bit about his experience being recruited to DePaul, why he chose DePaul, as well as his time after DePaul in his professional career and his uh, after basketball life. Uh, great, great, very grateful to have sat down with Marty and talked to him about all of that. We've got about 30 minutes with him. And then we will uh, shoot over to uh, my good friend Dalton from the Blue Demon Report, where we talk a little bit about the roster, some some of the goings on in the off season. But first, before we get into that, it was great to see Paul Reed back at Wintrust Arena this past weekend for graduation. Congratulations to him and to all the graduates from DePaul University this, this past weekend uh, on finishing your collegiate careers. Uh, it'll be great to see Paul back at Wintrust for a game, hopefully this fall. Uh, and... Uh, you know, another big event this weekend was Coach Doug Bruno from the women's basketball team being inducted into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame and the city of Chicago celebrating Coach Doug Bruno Day on June 11th, which was Saturday. Uh, we're talking about a coach with over 700 wins and taking his team to tourneys 18 out of the past 19 years and 25 tournaments overall. It's great to see all the pomp and circumstance throughout the city. He was uh, he was honored on the marquee at Wrigley Field, as well as joined in Knoxville by some of his former players and assistants uh, to celebrate. Doug's a class act, uh, well deserved for the work he's done on and off the court uh, with his girls with his girls basketball camps, mentoring over eighty thousand young athletes. So congratulations, Coach! You'll be forever honored for generations to come. All right, we'll jump into that interview with Marty Embry. It was a great sit down with him. Got to talk a lot about a lot of things. So sit back and enjoy this interview. All right, uh, thank you for uh, coming on today, uh, Marty Embry from uh, from uh, old Blue Demons of uh, of of past uh one of ray meyer's last coach teams if i think it was the last coach team uh thanks for coming on marty How are you my, today? my pleasure my pleasure i'm doing well so uh why don't we uh talk a little bit about that time back at DePaul? uh when you first when you first were being recruited uh what made you come want to come to chicago and come to play for coach ray and DePaul? Well, here's the thing, and, and I don't think people uh, really understood my lack of basketball knowledge. I played, but I wasn't a basketball fanatic. Okay. Um, Coach Ray was a big deal. And there's a rumor out that uh, the only player that he went out of state to see was Dallas Comages, but that's not true. Um, I was the first person, uh, the first player that he came out of Chicago to visit. And we got proof. So we got pictures of all this stuff. <laughs> all right. Um, but the main reason I chose DePaul was uh, because of Terry Cummings. Um, he was the first person that kind of influenced me. And and what happened is when I went to DePaul uh, for my visit, 
he was the first person that took me around campus and we sat and talked for a few hours and, and uh, you know, he shared with me that there was a possibility that, that he was going to go hardship that year and go pro. Um, and I felt like with him, once I started doing a little research on him and realized who Terry Cummings was, I said, oh, okay, so if he stays there, that's a good mentor to have. Sure. If he leaves, there's a good possibility that I'm going to play. Now, in the interim, I'm starting to do more research on Coach Ray, and I realized that he was one of the top coaches in the country as well. Um, I was also looking for a school that had smaller classrooms. I, you know, I had a, a huge um, dislike for going to campuses that had, you know, the big auditorium classrooms. So everything about DePaul, is, it kind of it kind of just fell in place. But Terry Cummings was the reason I went to DePaul. Second behind that is Walter Downing. So Walter was a good friend to me, you know, while he was there, and he gave me the good and the bad and the ugly. Now I went to visit more schools. But for me, Walter and Terry made the difference in, in the recruiting trip. That that's that's awesome, and I know uh, all those names you you mentioned. That that's uh, some pretty pretty uh, fun teams. It sounds like and fun people yeah. to kind of be around. So I, uh, as far as from a basketball perspective, uh, would be yeah makes sense with Ter- especially with Terry Cummings, and then uh, I know you know you said you mentioned Dallas Comages too. Uh, yeah. Those are, yeah. Those are some great teammates to, to have had or to to have played with. So, um, yep. aside, you know, those two, Ty Corbin, Kamajis, and Strickland, just to name a few. Uh, who was your Who was your favorite teammate? I guess in, for this, you know, for this purpose, let's say aside from Terry Cummings. Um, that that would be my freshman class. Um, we were all close. Uh, my favorite player would have to be Tyrone. Okay. Um, Tyrone, uh, he and Kenny Patterson were roommates, and his room was directly across from mine. But what, again, one of those things that nobody really knows a true story of why we became such good friends. Well, for three years, he was the person that um, kind of challenged me every day in practice. And then before every game, you know, we'd make bets. You know, not in, not anything illegal. Sure, 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 sure. So we make bets on who would get the most rebounds. So he would push me because I'm trying to grab everything and he's trying to grab everything. And at the end of the thing, you know, the first thing we do is grab the, the, the stat sheet, you know, after the game to see who actually had more rebounds. And we bet things like a, a, a two liter bottle of Coke. Uh, he had these really nice polo shirts. So I got a chance to win about three of those, three or four of those polo <laughs> shirts. Uh, so he he was by far my favorite guy. We stay, we stay in touch even now. We laugh about all of this stuff, you know, that happened at DePaul. But uh, on top of him being a good competitive teammate, he was also a good friend at the time. Yeah, that that was uh, that's that's cool that you guys all stay in touch. Uh, uh, that was one of my next questions: was do you, do you keep in touch with these guys? And I know that all you know, of them. We, we've seen, you know, I've seen some pictures online of you guys together at the athletic department at some of the games. Um, uh, that's that's really cool to have built that that uh, long lasting lifetime friendship and brotherhood. So awesome. Yeah. yeah. Awesome to hear yeah. that. Yeah. And we, we actually um, I think uh, me, Ty, uh, Lamone, um, Kevin and Tony probably stay in touch and Walter, sure. I probably stay in touch with them more so than anybody else because, again, even at DePaul, they were really my closest friends while I was at DePaul as well. So it only made sense that it kind of transitioned years down the road, and you know, all the all of the kids, you know, we're all uncles and and nephews and things like that. So uh, that that hasn't changed. Tony Tony actually came up when I had my restaurant in Michigan. He okay. came from California to the restaurant. Yeah, and uh, and Tyrone was actually an investor in the restaurant, so that Very that's cool. how close we are. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, no, and and Lamone. So back when I was uh, when I was a student and uh, working in the athletic department, I worked I worked with Lamone. It was when he first started working in the athletic department. It was, mm-hmm. it was that that man, uh, he's a bright bright sunshine of, like of everyone's day. He's he's the nicest guy ever. So, Lamone, you really? Yeah. No. I'm, jo- I'm joking, man. No, he's a nice guy. He's really a super nice guy. 
Yeah. No, you, you threw me off there. That was, uh, that's, that's funny. Um, so we, we talk about your basketball career and how, you know, that really wasn't your passion. It ended up being food, but, uh, uh, and, and, and cooking and, uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about your career overseas and uh, it's taking you all, all over the world, right? Where sure. was, what was the, what was your favorite place that you, that you got to play? Uh, and uh, why was it, why was it Italy? Well, um, you know, for me, the Italian league um, was, was the second strongest league. And yeah, it, it, it Italy by far was, was my favorite place. Uh, Ferrara, Ferrara. Um, that's the first team that I played for. And it was a small city that, uh, and the basketball team was really the heartbeat of, of the city. Sure. Um, and I got introduced to all sorts of people and all sorts of, you know, th- this amazing food. And all that did was just kind of stoke the fire a little bit for me wanting to do more in cooking. In my off time, um, we had a team president who was one of the nicest guys ever. Um, he would uh, he had friends that owned restaurants. So in my off time, I would go to some of the restaurants and kind of shadow the chefs that were there and jump in and do some little things like that. So when I opened up my own restaurant, that whole made fresh kind of transition, you know, from that Italian stuff, to the American stuff, um, but the, but the players, you know, being invited to to visit my players' families, um, I just became one of one of their kids, uh, and I don't think I had that in any other country that I played. And although I enjoyed the other countries, it was something different about the Italian people, and uh, they were just so so open and so warm and so friendly, um, and uh, even now. The, the, the Italian teams that I played for, I stay in touch with the majority of the players. Uh, a few guys have come back to Flint uh, to, when I was in Michigan to visit. Um, I just recently talked to one of my closest buddies from over there, and, and he's talking about coming here, not not this year, possibly next year or the year after because, you know, trying to get COVID, uh, get beyond sure. COVID. Yep. Um, but, but the Italian the Italian um, culture has so much that, that uh, I enjoy. And I don't think uh, I don't think that I ever leave. Even talking to my son and my daughter, we joke about moving over there. And, and I think uh, for them to even say that because they were little kids, you know, when they were over there, my daughter, uh, she was a little, you know, a little toddler, but she enjoyed it, you know. And that hasn't changed in thirty years. Yeah, and I think yeah, I mean that's that's that Mediterranean kind of mentality. Everyone, it's it's like yeah. the Midwest, the Midwest of Europe to some extent, where. As, Every, everyone's everyone's uh kind of brought in like family that's that's uh that's cool that you know from a professional level too where you were where you're brought in to play basketball and and they still opened their doors and ke- you know kept you as as one of their own uh what yeah. what, what was one of the the coolest meals wow uh, your favorite meal that you had in italy when you were playing over there um i, I don't i don't have a favorite meal um each country kind of presented a certain dish that I enjoy. But when you talk about Italian food, it's impossible to have a certain favorite meal because, you know, I had the Nona's preparing some of my food for me. And those grandmothers are in the kitchen and you wouldn't even think that they would be in the kitchen cooking, but they, they have that the old school value and the old school mentality. So when I go to certain mom pop restaurants and I get a chance to meet some of the, the, the people that, that are in the kitchen cooking, one, one in particular, um, it was a restaurant uh, called uh, the Centrale. The guy that, that owned it, his mother was the, the main cook. And when he finally brought her out to introduce her to me, she was this little lady probably in her mid-70s. You know, a little short, little old lady and just as sweet as can be. And her son told her how much I enjoyed her food. And she thanked me. And that particular day, he said, no matter when you come, um, you only pay this amount of, of lira. And I was like, no, you don't have to do that. And he said, no, 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 because apparently I said something to her and she just, she, I, I became her grandson. So she wanted to feed me. So I never asked for a menu. 
I would go there and and he would just bring me the food up. I never had a bad meal there, but everything was made from scratch. Um, they have great pizza, obviously, but the pasta dishes, they, they, they're made, uh, again, from scratch. Sure. They're made with fresh ingredients. And I mean, I just can't get enough of it. And that's how I make my pasta here now. You know, when I cook pasta for my for my home, I make it the way that I was shown how to make it over there. So I, 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 ooh, I can't even pick out a favorite because I, I love I don't think I've ever had a bad meal over there, to be honest. So, uh, you, you know, I'll, I'll get a, I'll get a little uh, goofy here. Uh, I don't I know you're on Twitter and I know you're uh, uh, into Italian food. But I don't know if you picked up that the last season, for whatever reason, I, I, I can't even put a name to it or put a finger on it, but chicken parmesan became like, I don't know, it, it became a thing within the DePaul fan base that's on Twitter. Do you have a chicken parm recipe in, in one of your cookbooks? Um, I got, I mean, I have nine cookbooks. I don't remember if I put that recipe in there. I, I try to do stuff that that's, as off base, sure. um, a spin on the original kind of thing. Right. Um, and I don't remember if I have a, uh, a chicken parm recipe in one of the books. I'm not well, sure. Well, we'll just, we'll just have to have, you know, the DePaul fan base on Twitter, go and pick pick up some of those books and check it out and make sure, you know, see what's in there. So <laughs> there's some good recipes in there though. And, yeah, and for one, sure. one of the books I ended up, uh, it was a it was a growth kind of book where I put every country I put my favorite meals in that cookbook things that I will come home and make I put those recipes in a book, um, but uh, no I, I don't and I don't think I ever had chicken parmesan over in Italy. Oh, fair enough. It's probably one of the yeah. realistically it's probably one of those Americanized you know Italian dishes, right? So yeah, but we yeah. you know we had to ask the people the people wanted to know so. You know, okay. we got we got to give them what they want. So okay, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, so yes, yeah, so why, why don't we talk a little bit more about your you know your cookbooks and your writing? Uh, I know you you've got a few things out there, and uh, you you've got your website uh, from court, from the court to the kitchen. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me, tell me a little bit about what it went into that. I know you know as we as we sit here and we're talking, food's a passion. Basketball had become a passion. Um, mm -hmm. uh, why, don't, why don't you tell me a little bit more about that and what, what's on there, what, what people can find on that website? Okay, so so the, the way the writing came to, to be, um, I had an English professor. I thanked her. Her name is uh, Professor Dean Jacobs. Um, and this is recent that I got a chance to thank her. She thought I was calling her to cuss her out and – you know, but yeah, there and stuff. I was like, no, 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 no. So when I was at DePaul, um, I, I apparently plagiarized the paper. Okay. So the, the difference, and for me, the difference in plagiarizing the paper is that you had to understand what plagiarism was. Sure. Which I didn't. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing the research and then I'm writing the quotes in, but because I didn't, I didn't acknowledge who the quotes came from, it was, plagiarism. So she marked me a, a felling grade. I redo the paper and fell in grade. I'm like, wow, what, what, lady, what do you want from me? You know, again, not understanding that she didn't understand that I didn't understand what plagiarism truly was and how serious of a crime that it was in college. Sure. So fast forward some years later, um, I got the notion to, to start writing a story. And in the back of my mind, I had Miss Miss Dean Jacobs, you know, what she was telling me, the plagiarism, the plagiarism, the plagiarism. Well, now I understood what it was. So I kind of I kind of acknowledged that she was the one that kind of kept me interested in writing, even though she failed me for the class, for the English class that I had when I had to write the paper. But she set the groundwork for me. And uh, when I did the first book, um, which it was just a cookbook. Um, I enjoyed it. And then I did the second one and then a third one and then a fourth one. And then I started thinking about writing a novel. But I was also told that write about things that you're passionate about. 
So it kind of translated into writing about everything. Not that I'm passionate about erotica, <laughs> which is, you know, three of my books. Um, but um, the story is really good. It's not just about sex. It's really about a great story and the transitions, you know, over over three different protagonists that transition from each book. Um, when I started writing the novels about self-help and, you know, uh, uh, one of the books I wrote, Dark Secrets from the South, is about uh, uh, physical abuse against men. You know, those are things that I was passionate about, not because I was physically abused, but because I knew folks who were physically ab abused by their spouses, both male and female. Sure, yeah. So a as I started writing these books, um, I, I got involved with writing one about depression because that's one of the things I have to deal with is depression. And people, they don't think that, well, you know, you have a great life. What do you have to be depressed about? It doesn't quite work that way. You know, right. so I wrote this this kind of self-help book about about depression. And uh, I found that that was um, something that opened up a lot of other men that were, that were going through it. Um, from that, I also found that a lot of athletes go through a depression and they don't understand it's a huge drop when you go from playing basketball professionally or playing football professionally. And then you got to go have this now this mundane life. And, right. you know, I said mundane because it's not like what you're accustomed to when you're playing and when you're making this ridiculous amount of money every month. And now you go into a regular nine to five job where the money may be decent, but it's not ridiculous like when you play basketball. Sure. Uh, so, sure. so as I wrote, it was kind of therapeutic for me. And the more I wrote, the more I wanted to write. Um, when I finally got around to trying to find uh, the professor, I, I thanked her for not just giving me a grade. You know, I thanked her for not just passing me along. I thanked her for making me think about what I wanted to write. And, and, and she always felt like I could write a good story, but again, she didn't understand that I didn't know I didn't know how to construct that story, you know, to make it so there was a legitimate story. Um, so it, it it kind of you know it it kind of transitioned uh, for me uh, just because I enjoy what I do, and I think you know because I enjoy it. Well, shoot, everybody else should enjoy reading about it because it's enjoyable. It doesn't work out that way, you know that. But but it, it takes nothing away from me. And I I tell my kids often. I said, you know, you would think that I write the books to really make a lot of money doing. It. I don't. I write the books for my kids because, like I told them, I said, long after I'm gone, you'll have a history of everything I did right on these, you know, in this on this paperwork, right in these books, on these manuscripts. It's even in my will that my kids get all of my manuscripts and things like that. And I may not make a dime off of it. They will at some point because, sure. again, those are, those are great stories to have. Yeah, um, so, so there's there's some reading on, on my website for everybody, whether you are a basketball person, a, 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 a fan of cooking, a fan of uh, being an expat, you know, over in Europe. There's something for everybody on that on that website. Yeah, that's really cool that you uh, that you were able to do that, and uh, you know, also open up about you know depression and and uh, yeah. and dealing with that too. That's a uh, that's a huge deal. So th thank you for sharing that. And I yeah. think I yeah. think too, uh, the more and more people, or these days, more and more people realize are at least coming to that realization that uh, competing at such a high level, going through all of that, and then you know one day it's done, and and there's there's no one else there that can really uh understand what what that meant to you and what that meant, meant means to any athlete performing at a high level and competing at that elite level so very yeah. very uh very cool i'm definitely uh you you've got me you've got a customer in me at the very least i'm gonna have to pick that up and check that out and um uh so uh you know thank you for sharing that and uh it's a really really cool story to, to hear from from the side of the professor you know uh yeah it's that it's that uh adage of you give a man you give a man a fish you feed him for a day teach a man to fish you feed him for a lifetime so true very, very true. cool very cool um yeah. uh so uh have you been to have you you know switching back to a little bit more about uh 
a little bit more of DePaul. Have you been back to uh, to uh, game recently? Have you been to Winchester Arena? No, I, I've never. Um, I've never gone to a game uh, at the at the new arena. Um, COVID kind of you know stopped me from doing that, and um, I you know we stay in touch as me and the guys that are, that are in Chicago and guys to go back to the games. And so I'm constantly in touch with them about, you know, what DePaul lacks. And then when I see the games, uh, when I see the games uh, on TV, um, I can kind of dissect what's missing and, you know, what, what they need. And, you know, everybody can be an armchair coach. Um, but for me, I'm a real, I'm a really technical um, kind of, player coach uh and i can look at and my my mindset is always on the bigs never the point guards it's always on the bigs what can the bigs do to be better and there are certain things when i'm sitting here watching the game and i i just shake my head because i feel like the the pause mentality has always been you guys might win but you're going to limp off this court. You're not going to walk off the court like, you know, fist hell high. You're going to walk off the court like, man, those guys are like ruthless. And I just don't think, you know, this year was a little different, but I don't think the past DePaul teams had those players that were just ruthless, players that just just didn't care. You know, and I mean that in a positive way. Just I don't care who you are. You're not coming in here you know, trying to dictate anything on this court. We're, we're dictating everything. And I think when I was at DePaul, folks don't realize that that the mentality that we had, it was the same thing in the game that we that it was in practice. We went after each other like we hated our, each other's guts because everybody was trying to get playing time. And I, I put something on Twitter uh, a, a long time ago. I said, if if you are... If you are, you know, um, the subs, the the starting five would never have a day off. If you're the starting five, the subs would never have a chance to play. So, and that means that if you have a starting position, you're going to push the sub so hard that he ain't playing no time soon. But if you're also a sub, you're going to push that starter every day to say, okay, it's just a matter of time before I take your spot. Right. So that way it makes it really competitive. And um, our practices at DePaul were super competitive because everybody was good enough to start and everybody wanted to start, but there can only be one. You know, there was only one start in every position, you know, and, and the mentality was that you ain't playing today. Sorry, unless I get in foul trouble, you you get, get some water, take your time. That same mentality I took overseas, and I felt like anybody that played behind me, you'll be, you'll be lucky to get five minutes a game because I'm not trying to have you come in and play at all. But I think that that is the problem with a lot of the players uh, of today is that a lot of players seem like they're almost entitled. Like, okay, I'm at DePaul. I'm the superstar. I better be playing. No, that's not how it works. You earn that spot. And I think a lot of players want that spot to be given to them. And I'm just not a fan of it. You know, I'm a huge DePaul fan. I tell folks, I don't care if they go, you know, 0-25. I'm, I'm wearing my DePaul jersey proudly because I know everything cycles. You know, it's just a matter of time before DePaul cycles back up again. Um, I think with, with Stubbs, I think uh, with the players that he's bringing, when the one guy transferred to St. John's, everybody was in an uproar about the transfer. I said, why? The portal is open. You know, the portal is, is every school's best friend and worst nightmare. But sure. there are going to be other players that are going to be in a portal that feel like that they can, you know, go to DePaul and, 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 and be an impact player. Well, when a guy transferred, that just opened up the door for some other good players to come in. That, From what I've been reading, they, they're going to have some good players to come in. Yeah. So I that think he's trying to – yeah. Oh, so he's yeah. trying to tremble with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mo, Mo Gibson and uh, Caleb Murphy were two of the two of the big uh, pickups. So yeah. yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just wish they changed their mentality um, to to that to that. They don't know the the younger guys don't know the history of DePaul. They know Coach Ray. They know you know 
Joy Meyer. They know Terry Cummins. They know Mark Aguirre, Ross Strickland, but they don't know the history of the, the, the type of players that were at DePaul. And I think if they understood the history, then they would try, hopefully they would try to, you know, fill in those shoes the same way, because I think that's the only way to win it. You, you can be a technical player, but if you don't, if you don't have that dog, that that hardcore, hard nosed work ethic, that Midwest work ethic, they still going to struggle. That that's just my little opinion on it. No, I think there's a lot of that. I mean, uh, you know, that's that. Uh, what is it? The junkyard dog, Antoine Davis. I think was one of the one of the guys. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, that uh, when looking back, like that's what you that's what you envisioned was the embodiment of a. DePaul basketball player. So yeah, I think yeah. you're, I think there's definitely a lot of truth there, especially in today's <laughs> modern game. That's, that's more, you know, finesse, that's more high paced uh, to have that as well as a tool in your back pocket. Uh, definitely will uh, definitely will set, set the, these, the, these current DePaul teams apart from, from the competition. So yeah, uh, yep, I agree. End up at a game this year. You think we'll be able to see you out yeah, there? I'm- yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get to a game in a before the winter and hopefully right after the winter. So sure. I hope I can avoid the the, the snow. Yeah, I'm I'm not a snow guy. <laughs> yeah, I don't think as much as people in the Midwest say that you know they're okay with snow. I don't think any of us are okay with snow. <laughs> no, no sir. Um, uh, so that, that kind of wraps up all of my, uh, questions, go check out Marty's website, uh, from, from the court to the kitchen.com, uh, check them out on Amazon and, uh, pick up some of that Coney, Coney dog seasoning and see, start, start making some, uh, some Coney dogs for next year. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks that, again, Marty. My pleasure. It's some good stuff too, John. You got to try it, man. It's really some good stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to, uh, sounds like a plan. All right. Thanks again. All right, thanks. I appreciate it, man. You take care. You too. All right, welcome in to Dalton from the Blue Demon Report. Uh, brought him in today to talk talk with me a little bit about uh, the off season this year and uh, going into next season, what we've got uh, on our plates ahead of us. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Dalton, and. Uh, uh, hope you're uh, hope you're as excited as I am going into next year. Yeah, thanks for having me today, John. I'm uh, really looking forward to this upcoming season. Seeing Stubbs uh, turn the roster around a little bit, bringing in some more high major talent. It's uh, it's nice to see the Blue Demons uh, adding to that. Sure, yeah, and uh, it's been busy for it's been a busy summer already for the coaching staff. Uh, we've added five players going into the 22 uh 22 campaign Mo Gibson and Caleb Murphy and as well as Zion Cruz kind of highlighting those uh highlighting that that uh new recruiting class uh and of course Ungenda coming back with that said what who makes the biggest contribution next season I think I think it's going to be Caleb Murphy I I've, I've got really high hopes for uh for Murphy, he's a point guard that DePaul DePaul hasn't seen anyone of that caliber in quite some time. Him and uh, him and Gibson are going to make a really good pairing in the backcourt. Uh, just the way that they both complement each other, Gibson can really knock it down from three. Murphy can penetrate, pass the ball. Is a really good, really good athlete. Uh, and then we still have Jalen Terry. Uh, we can't sure. can't knock him out. So uh, I really think the the guard play that DePaul has is right at the top of the Big East. I I really do. Yeah, certainly. And then, of course, you know, with Mo Gibson, his shooting, the, the caliber of shooting uh, that he brings to the table is going to be really, really helpful. And I think uh, with Murphy and uh, Terry that a lot of times people say good shootings contagious. So uh, definitely an uptick from uh, last season. Uh, Mo, Mo Gibson shot, what, 40 percent last year from from three. And uh, second. I got it pulled up right here. Yeah, we had him at a thirty nine percent, but still, he's a forty percent right. career three point shooter. Two years in the Big Twelve, three years in Conference USA. So, yeah, and and those are you know legit legit. Uh, well, Big Twelve is le- some pretty legit talent he's going up against. So uh, definitely coming to the Big East, it'll be a a solid addition. Um, and of course, you know Caleb Murphy. He he seems like that that human. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, people call it like a joystick a, or human. Uh, yeah, he's a human highlight reel. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, cutting through defenses. Yeah, he's – I I don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it. I really think he might be the best point guard in the Big East. Really? That's, I do. That's, um, uh, I, I mean, I, I could definitely see it looking back and watching I some mean, of the, the tape from last year. Especially, like, no knock to – where he's at last year, but they did not have any talent around him. When you surround that kid with talent, you, you're you going to see his numbers go up. His shooting percentages are going to go up. His assist numbers are going to go up. It's just a much better situation for him. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, knowing that Zion, Mo, and Caleb are signed to uh, seemingly all through social media interactions, they're all heading towards Chicago or they're going to be on campus sooner rather than later uh, to really get that going. Uh that cohesiveness and that uh, that team team cohesiveness, uh, something that we haven't really seen from our coaching staff bringing guys in. How how, do, how will that play in? I think getting the guys in here early is something that Stubbs wants, and it's something that the previous regimes never never could get the full team to buy in over the summer. And when you're getting your players who are going to be your leaders for next year, getting in here early in the summer, like starting classes. Like last year, I know we only had three or four got scholarship players that they had on campus when Stubbs came in. So we're really going to see a difference, I hope, this year. Because you could tell last year's team really got along. But that cohesiveness is going to come together even more this year, getting the guys in early. And then they're going to be able to practice with each other every day, even if it's not the whole team there, but you still have 75% of them. They're still sure. playing together. Like, cause it's, like you said, it's going to be a new team. They're going to be learning each other's strengths, weaknesses. And most of all, they're going to be – Stubbs is going to be able to watch over them every day and – and still the uh, the Stubbs way, the uh, new DePaul way. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, uh, well, that's been one thing that's leaps and bounds ahead of where we've – what we've had uh, in, in the recent past is uh, development of players has been uh, far ahead of what we've seen. So uh, getting those guys in, getting them to, to feel out like you said, their strengths and weaknesses will be huge. Um, other name, uh, sorry, I got to back up here. You know, we, we did, we talked about it. We've talked about it in our conversations and you hear it across the fan base. They lost their leader of JFL, uh, Javon Freeman Liberty. Uh, who steps up in that role? Who's the, the, the field general uh, that, that comes in next year? I feel like right away, Jalen Terry is going to be the one that speaks up. That's that's Stubbs' guy. He he knows what to expect. But someone being an upperclassman, a fifth year player, grad transfer, Mo Gibson, I think he's going to be he's going to be that guy that everyone's going to look to because he's the super senior there. He's he's been doing it for a while sure. now. Yeah, and uh, I I think that that'll be really good uh, good to have Mo Gibson there. Showing showing some of the younger guys the ropes, getting them kind of up to speed, and and uh, really pass, uh, passing the torch for for the future seasons ahead. So uh, I I would agree there. I, I do think uh, Javon jo- Johnson too could be one of those guys uh, that that steps up. Uh, maybe not as uh, you know. I guess you you're used to seeing the field general come from the the front court or I'm sorry the back court, but. Um, uh, I could see him stepping up and taking a big, big leap as well. You know, going going back to uh, the new additions for this season, uh, why don't we go through, go, go down the list and uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the p- profiles of the new guys. Why don't we start with uh, Zion Cruz, top 100 guy, top, yeah, top 100 guy uh, coming in next year. Zion Cruz, that's, that's a guy who I remember – following him as he was coming through high school and he was a five star for as long as I can remember. He made the transfer to Donda Academy. He dropped, committed to DePaul, dropped even more. You know, that's how it goes. But he's a guy, he's a three level scorer. He can play on the ball, off the ball. I think he's going to do very big things for the Blue Demons. I don't know if it's we're going to necessarily see that spark this year if he's held back by uh, some of the upperclassmen or transfers we've got coming in, but whether it's this year or next year, he's he's going to be one of the better guys in the Big East. Yeah, and I think uh, his uh, he's he's only going to go up too. Like as far as he's going to grow, he's, he's already you know, six he's five. Yeah, grow a couple inches. Yeah, right. So uh, I think that'll be some of that length that we kind of need on the roster as well uh, from his position, from the guard position, so or combo guard position. So uh, that'll be a, a a sight for uh, 
for us to have and uh, really nice to have that kind of caliber player coming in uh jumping forward if you want to uh pick pick one of the new guys you want to talk about as well so one that hasn't necessarily gotten a lot of love is deshaun nelson i think i think he is going to be a nice piece i don't know if we're going to see it this year because i know sometimes it takes juco guys a year to tra- translate it into the division one game but he is a freak athlete you can't teach that kind of athleticism the way he can play on the wing in the post I don't know if it's going to be this year or next year, but he will definitely leave his mark on the program. He's he's going to be nice. <laughs> yeah, from some of the videos I've seen, uh, he he flies with he's a uh, he's like a uh, even more explosive Brandon Johnson. I, I'd have to say that's a really like, good really good looked, comparison. He he flies like uh, the, some of the dunks that were just monstrous dunks that he had, and and I, he he pull and his pull up shots too. They they all look really smooth and uh something that we definitely are gonna ha- have to we're gonna have to see uh, a little bit more in the biggest and play so his, his versatility uh, defensively is insane he'll be able to guard i don't want to say one through five but on a switch he's not going to struggle he's so athletic and then offensively he can run baseline run high post low post play out on the wing probably even he can create his own shot if it's as long as it's not against like a guard you're going to be able to get him on a mismatch yeah, or right. take a big guy off the dribble Sure. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, KT Ramey, why don't we stick with, uh, uh, Juco, uh, Juco transfers, uh, where do you see him fitting in? So with KT, I know this year, uh, after a couple games, he was focusing on DePaul. So, uh, there wasn't much highlights from him this year, but from what I've seen, KT's another one. He's an athlete, three level score can put the ball in the hole. And more importantly to me, seeing these guys that commit to Stubbs and commit to DePaul, as early as KT did previously, we weren't seeing that with previous regimes. These kids weren't ready to buy in and KT is already a high level kid. He wants to be there. Like I said, three level score. He's going to be another one that I can see. Like I said, the Juco thing, I don't know if it'll be this year or next year, but KT will make an impact. Certainly. Yeah. And it, and it's nice to see him stick through the, uh, stick through the commitment as well. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen our share of early commits and then fall offs as well. So, Good to see that happen, and uh, why don't we finish off with uh, with Murphy? Yeah, man, I I am a big Caleb Murphy guy. I really, when I look at the point guards in the Big East, I I see Murphy, and I see I don't the point guard from Creighton. Why can't I think of his name? Kalum, no Kaluma, That's not Kaluma. Nim uh, Nimard, I think. Oh yeah, uh, oh, gosh. Yeah, it's escaping me, but yeah, and then um, obviously Curbelo with St. John's, but Murphy, what he did, watching full game, full games, and watching his highlights, he he had no talent around him, and he's he's gonna have shooters around him at DePaul and guys with versatility. He's gonna have Mo Gibson, Javen Johnson, Jalen Terry might be playing off the ball some, Zion Cruz, he's gonna have guys around him. And he had uh, one of his best games. Didn't wasn't it Auburn? Auburn? Yeah, he oh, locked like, up window window yeah. green that game, and that's that's a guy right there. Yeah, that was that was pretty sick. Yeah. Uh, I said finish up with Murphy, but we didn't. We uh, probably circle back around to Mo Gibson. Uh, probably my favorite addition, uh, just because I'm a sucker for for a wet jump shot. So, uh, what do you think about him? I think this is the perfect situation for him because. Caleb will be able to guard the one. Murphy will be able to guard the two. He reminds He's going to remind a lot of Blue Demon fans of, of Charlie Moore. I know some people are salty how he left and everything, but he reminds me so much of Charlie Moore, just with more consistency in that jump shot. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I and two, uh, the, the waiver should be coming around, right? Like, there shouldn't be much concern there. I hope not. I mean, the way it sounded, yeah. I know guys have already been starting to get waivers. Uh you just you never know with NCAA. Fingers crossed. <laughs> right. Yeah. One one last you know one last thing that we should probably touch on is the biggest news from this week. We don't know where you know right now he's a twenty three, but uh, maybe a twenty two. Tafara Gapar from uh, South Kent by way of or from New Zealand by way of South Kent. Uh, where do you see him fitting in this year, next year? Um, Obviously, right now it's next year, but uh, if he were to come in this year, how do you how do you see that? Obviously, that puzzle fit puzzle piece. Yeah, fit that in? one's that one's going to be up to him and uh, his guys. But uh, 
whether it's this year or next year, he's going to come in and make an impact from day one. You you can't teach that kind of talent. He'll be able to guard one through five. He'll be able to bring the ball up, play in the post, play on the wing. He's he's insane. DePaul hasn't had a guy like that for as long as I can remember. He's at uh, six six ten. I mean, six, six ten can shoot, handle the ball, rebound, defend, bring the ball up, facilitate. I mean, that's yeah, just like that's a dream. That's a dream. So. Yeah, I mean, he's a modern player, right? Like, he's he's that uh, Kevin Durant uh, profile type. Uh, That's the Stubbs guy right there. Yeah. It's great. So, uh, definitely looking forward to whenever he get, he gets on campus. Uh, uh, but for sure, an exciting moment. I got to got to kind of stick it to the Big Ten again. Uh, DePaul owns them in the Gavit games. And uh, – now we we got one one other victory over them, uh, beating out Maryland for Tafari Gapar. That'll be nice to see where Gapar lands uh, either this year or next year, regardless of the situation. Uh, it's really exciting to have that type of caliber person coming into uh, whatever recruiting class he lands in. Uh, that said, uh, as it stands right now, where do you see DePaul landing within the Big East this season? As of right now, I think the ceiling is maybe in Tier B, right, right underneath that Creighton, Villanova, Providence, Xavier, right in that area. Uh, I think we're for sure better than Marquette, Butler, Georgetown. Sure. Um, we're probably right in that, that second tier. The ceiling, I would say, is right around Tier B, yeah. Sure. And I think too, like, if you look at, if you look back at last year, obviously we've lost a couple big pieces, um, unfortunately, but I think, uh, we've got players now that Stubbs that, that fits in Stubbs, uh, game plan that fits in his profile as far as a coach. Uh, and he got those guys last year playing to the level that they did. We're talking six wins in the big East, nothing to write home about by any means, but definitely progress from where we had been. Uh, I could see this team finishing, like you said, in that tier B somewhere between five and eight realistically is, is my, my thought, the ceiling and the floor at eight there. Um, but I mean, the way, the way the cohesiveness builds right now that we're talking about in the summer ahead of time, getting guys on campus, that ceiling is more realistic than I think a lot of people thought, uh, three weeks ago, a month ago, uh, from, from the fan base and from other, uh, other, uh, big East, uh, pundits. I, DePaul will get no love until they get back in the dance from anyone outside of Chicago. That's just how, that's sure. just how it is. We're going to be looked at as a bottom feeder, kind of like the Cubs were until they got back to the world series. It's just it's how DePaul is going to get looked at until they get, they show that they are who they are, who, who we know they are. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Who we know they are. Well, uh, Dalton, it's been a good time. Uh, we'll definitely have you got have you back. Uh, hopefully, more more times in the future than uh, than not. Uh, of course. Thanks again for joining me, and uh, definitely look forward to uh, to uh, more of this off season and talking to you a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, thanks for having me, John. Hope be back on whenever you want me. So, uh, so yeah. The door is always open, so we'll talk soon. Sounds good. Had a really great time talking with Marty Embry about his time at DePaul and his post-basketball career. Don't forget to check out his website from the court to the kitchen.com and pick up a cookbook or some of that Coney Island seasoning. It was also nice to sit down with Dalton from the Blue Demon Report, talk about the roster additions that Stubblefield and Company have made. Uh, the top 100 guys, Ian Cruz, adding guys from the portal, Mo Gibson and Caleb Murphy, and the two ju junior college guys, uh, Deshaun Nelson and KT Ramey looks like on paper, this roster has improvements, uh, in depth athleticism and three point shooting as well. So it should be nice to see how that develops, especially now with guys coming in early to get acclimated to each other. Uh, Zion Cruz and, uh, Caleb Murphy are both in Chicago as I say this. And as I record, uh, and I know other guys, uh, like Ngenda and your, are all in Chicago right now. So it, it'll be really nice to see how 
that camaraderie builds this offseason and translates to success on the court, especially in those late game situations. So with that said, until next time, Blue Demon Nation, go Blue Demons.